I believe that great worship is a sign of revived hearts. And uh, I'm blessed. Uh, Mark and I have been together more years than we care to count. But uh, uh, just what God does with us each week uh, through music, there are two original projects that Mark has written that our church has done that are down in the bookstore area, and he didn't ask me to plug that. I just like to plug it. Uh, when Tom Elliff was president of the International Mission Board, uh, they did something they'd never done in the history of the Mission Board. They made a music video of missionaries around the world, of praise and of worship and people being baptized and lives being changed. And the, the music bed for that was Jesus, Hope of the World, a song that Mark wrote. And uh, still one of my favorite songs. I'm, I'm really blessed. I hope you are. You see, when you want God to work, you begin to ask God to send you the people that will help you do what God's called you to do. And so in a little town like Albany, Georgia, that's 70% African American, and most of the churches are white, ours is one of the exceptions to that rule. And when you're in the fourth poorest city in America and you've been hit by three natural disasters since January the 2nd of this year, you better be asking God to send you the right people. And he has. And I'm grateful for that. Manly Beasley said, the presence of God is hard to define. But his absence is easy to detect. I asked Manley one day about two churches, equal sizes, uh, well-known, both on television. And if you didn't know Manley Beasley, you missed a blessing. You'll get to meet him in heaven. But Manley said, well, Michael, he said, one of them, when you go there, it's like going to the New Jerusalem. The other one, it's like going to Disney World. You can draw a crowd. But it doesn't mean you have a church. And I want to speak to you tonight on the subject of famished. Because I think we are in a condition of famine. I, you know, I, the Lord just does crazy things. You know, we didn't know uh, four or five days ago that John Avant was going to preach. I had no idea what John was going to preach. I had no idea what Daniel was going to do. And this has just flowed as if God was in control. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. It's just like moved, like God was in control. I, he, here's our problem. The world lacks a prophet. And so we are wandering in a wilderness. But the church has too many voices, and we don't have a prophet. No one to call us to repentance, no one to call us to truth. And so we operate in this vacuum where we should be operating in power. There are 46,000 churches in my denomination. Recent study, 41,600 of them are plateaued or dying. 41,600 out of 46,000 are plateaued or dying. Let me ask you something. Is the population of America decreasing? Are the needs decreasing? Are we better than we were 50 years ago morally, ethically? No. But churches are dying. Why? Because we've forgotten why God put us on planet Earth. We've forgotten the Great Commission. We've forgotten the Great Commandment. We've forgotten that repentance and faithfulness to God is the key to reaching a community for Christ. And the other thing we've forgotten is we've tried to evangelize and pastors have beaten their heads against the wall to say, we need to win our community to Christ. But folks, carnal people don't care about lost people. The only people that care about lost people are people on fire for Jesus. Carnal people do not care if their neighbors go to hell. If they did, they'd do something about it. And, and so I, I look around and I see all of this has happened in my lifetime. We've had the worship wars. We've had the, the 
choir robes, no choir robe wars. We've had the piano organ. Who plugged the guitars into the wall wars? I mean, we've had all that stuff. We, we, we are obsessed with style over substance. We are obsessed with preferences over power. We would rather die and fight for our preferences than beg for the power of God. And what we have created is a Christian subculture where we come together in our holy huddles. We're a glorified rotary club and we're a glorified country club and we do our things and it meets our needs. But once our kids are grown and our kids are gone, we go, well, the world can just go to hell. We don't care about the world because our needs are being met. A friend of mine says this, it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about him and it's about them. But listen, the church is never going to get that in an unrevived state. Because the average person is ready, as Vance Havner said, for church to start at 11 o'clock sharp and end at 12 o'clock dull. And the church give up her dead. We are in a parched condition. John talked about the fact that, that everything around the world is showing signs of revival except America. So the question has to come, why isn't it happening here? Why isn't it happening in our churches? Why isn't there the hunger? I believe we've grieved the Holy Spirit because we've tried to do the work of God in the energy of the flesh. And we do not walk in overcoming power. We do not walk in believing faith. We are surprised when God shows up. We are surprised when God works. Uh, Tom Phillips told, told me a story at dinner night. I've just got to throw this in. It's, it's free. It's not in the notes. Uh, during the days of the Jesus movement, he was out on a beach with these guys, and this guy had a hole in his radiator about this big. And so he said, we need to pray. This guy says, we need to pray. And so he gathers all these beach bums that are former drug addicts and dope heads and everything else. He, they gather around a car, and they start praying for Jesus to heal the car. And they're just calling on the name of Jesus. Lord, heal the radiator. Heal the car. I mean, they're calling on Jesus. Now, you know what would happen. The deacons would have to meet to decide if that's inappropriate or not. <laughs> and you'd have to get a committee to study broken radiators to bring back a report to see if we need to amend the Constitution and bylaws to allow us to pray for things that we've never prayed for before. And so this guy gets water, pours it into it, and dries off. Tom sees him a few days later, and he says, hey, did you get your car to the shop? I said, why? <laughs> so we, you had a hole in your radiator. He said, we prayed for God to heal it. And I mean, it, can I tell you something? It shocks us when God does something that we can't explain. Now, I'm not talking about radiators. I'm talking about changed lives. Because we look at people and say, God can't change them. God can't change them. God can't do that. And so our churches are dead and they're dry. Our altars are empty. Our eyes are dry. And we never ask why. Why is it that way? Charles Finney said, revival presupposes declension. Our staff is going through a study uh, with a, a pastor in America. We're doing it by, doing it by video. And, and we're just listening to him talk about life and ministry and church. And in the middle of one of his sessions a couple of weeks ago, he talked about the things that inhibit revival and the things that are catalysts for revival. And he made a statement, and I'd never heard anybody put it down like this. And so I want to give you the five things he says about revival that are never out of this order. They're always in this order. The first is personal revival. If we want to have revival, it has to begin with personal revival. Love God with all your heart. Personal revival. But then there is relational revival. Love your neighbor as yourself. Personal revival, relational revival, get it right with God and then get it right with one another. And one of the things he said was two of the signs of relational revival is our singing gets better. Listen, when you're in revival, nobody's worried about if they have a good voice or not. When you're in revival, nobody's worried about if they're being heard or not. 
By the way, if you ever want to just sing as loud as you can ever sing and not worry about it, go to Brooklyn Tabernacle for a prayer meeting or on a Sunday, and you can't hear yourself singing. It's so loud in there. You know why? Because they've never gotten over being saved. Most of our churches are full of people that are over being saved. They got saved and they got over it. Relational revival. The singing gets better and people want to hang around more. They want to fellowship with one, or one another. They want to spend time with one another because it's the family. It's the body life. Harmony comes out of harmony. When we're in harmony with God, we want to be in harmony with one another. Number three, missional revival. We begin to discover the purposes of God. Why he put the church on this planet. Four is structural renewal and revival. You can't put new wine in old wineskins, but here's where he says the average church makes changes. Structural renewal. They will start there and not go to personal renewal and relational renewal and missional renewal. They'll start with structural renewal. Now, let me just give you an example. A couple of years ago, we did a refresh conference uh, in Boston, just finished one in, uh, in Philadelphia, and we went to the church uh, where George, Whit George Whitfield is buried under the church. When Whitfield died, the day he died, he preached at the window of the house, and a thousand people were standing in the street to listen to him preach. We went in that church. They have the bone box from his arm in the lobby, just sitting in the lobby. I thought, hey, I can confess stealing George Whitfield's bone box, put it, you know, I mean, they got all this classic treasures of Christianity just sitting in there. You can't even hardly get in the church. I think it took us three times before we could finally get into it. And I went in, I said, I'm just going to pick up a bulletin and see. This was the pastor's column. After much discussion and many meetings, we have decided that instead of the 9 o'clock or the 10 o'clock hour for worship, we will meet at 9.30. We hope that this will help everyone and that you'll understand if we're not meeting at the hour that you wanted to meet at. And I'm thinking Whitfield must be down there in that crib going, let me out. I've got something to say. Get over yourselves. And the church on every pew in the front, flowers, boxes, stuff stored, where one day evidences of a great awakening took place. And now it's as dead as a hammer. But I would submit to you that we often try in our churches for structural revival. Let's change the system. Let's do it at a different time. Let's Let's start with a prayer instead of a song. Let's start with a song instead of a prayer. Let's not do the doxology this week. And we're doing all the things that have nothing to do with real personal and corporate revival. And then there's cultural re revival or cultural renewal. Now, when you've gone through the first four, you've got revival. When you get to the cultural renewal, you've got awakening. Because what's driving the culture today is entertainment, sports, and music. What ought to be driving the culture today is the church. The church ought to be swinging the culture, not the culture swinging the church. And us compromising to try to make the world feel more comfortable. And so when the church is revived, an awakening explodes. But, but here's our problem. We are like Samson. We are asleep in the lap of compromise. And our hair has been cut. And our power is gone. But we think we can just turn a switch on and at any moment go out and defeat the devil. And the devil is laughing at us. That our inability to understand that you can't lay in the lap of Delilah and stand up and fight with the sword of the Lord. Too many Demases who love this present world. Too many diatrophies who love the preeminence. Vance Havner said, the church needs a mourner's bench and the first mourners ought to be the members. We sit like spiritual connoisseurs, glorified critics, inwardly sizing up what we hear. So what are the evidences of famine? Well, a declining church. Frivolous spirits arguing over the trivial and the non-essential. You know, I, I preached in a meeting one time <laughs> And this guy walked up to me and he said, you know, preaching is magnifying Jesus. I said, yes, sir, it is. 
He said, you know, when you preach, you should always magnify Jesus. I said, yes, sir, you should. He said, you know, preaching is all about Jesus. I said, yes, sir, it is. And he started poking me in the chest, and he said, you can't magnify Jesus without a tie on. <laughs> and for a moment, I asked God to forgive me. And I said, well, I guess that what ticks you off about Jesus, because he wore a robe. <laughs> Listen, folks, when, when style and what we grew up with becomes more important with what God's trying to do now, we're in trouble. We are in trouble. Fighting. Fighting with one another. People fighting over everything in the world in the church. I mean, sometimes you need, it, it, you need a, a moderator to stop the fighting. Some of you have been in business meetings. I remember a deacon at, at Sherwood who said to me, I can remember the days at Sherwood when I would leave a deacon's meeting and sit in my car and weep over the things that we said to one another. People are fed up. You know why they're fed up? Because they're full on junk food. They're full on junk food. Uh, I, I've said this a number of times. The Refresh team knows this. A guy walked up to me one day. He said, you know, my, my two favorite preachers are you and Joel Osteen. I said, that is not possible. <laughs> there is no way. <laughs> I mean, you must have the volume down on your TV or something. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Faber said, the ill of all ills is the lack of desire. The Bible says it this way, you are rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing. Why are we in a famished condition? Well, I started looking at famine and there's some gruesome realities about famine, but in the Horn of Africa today, there's a catastrophic doubt, drought. In 2016, the BBC reported that there were 10 million Ethiopians requiring food aid. Famine early warning says that number is low. It really should be 15 million. And this is what they said. A state of emergency means that they are unable to access adequate food for survival and face an increased risk of malnutrition and mortality. The American church is in a famine and it doesn't even know it. We don't even know it. You know why? As desperate as the days are in which we live, where terrorists are trying to figure out how to destroy our country, where political angst is at an all-time high, where there's hatred of people and distrust of people, have you seen an increase in prayer meetings in the average church? Most of them don't even have a prayer meeting. And if they do, they only pray over ingrown toenails <laughs> and things that a doctor can fix. Paul didn't waste his time praying a lot for physical situations. Paul prayed for spiritual people to be spiritually healthy. He prayed for the spiritual health of the church. And you call a prayer meeting and say, hey, we're going to go down the roles of the people in our church that hadn't been here, and then we're going to go see them and talk to them for the love of their soul. Get your heart right with God, and you'll watch. It'll just be you and Jesus. They'll stay away. Now, if, if, you know, if they get an ingrown toenail, they're going to call the church. They're going to want the pastor to visit. They want to make sure it's on the prayer list. But they're not honest enough and broken enough to say, I have a prodigal child. Or my marriage is in the pits. Or we're about to go through a divorce because pride leads to famine. When we're not honest about where we really are and what we need. So we live in this fast food Christianity that covers up a malnourished church. I mean, you can go in a Christian bookstore and you can find how to do Christian exercise. You can find how to do Christian diets. You can read Christian fiction. I mean, you can get anything in a Christian bookstore except something to tell you how to know God better. You know, the fiction section takes up 14 rows. So I'd like a really good commentary on one of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, we may have one back there in the back, somewhere in the corner by the restroom because nobody ever goes back that far. Yeah, there might be one back there because we're not feeding, printing, writing, or challenging our people to study the Word. And so we're in a famine. 
Havner said this, the tragedy of the day is that the situation is desperate and the saints are not. When you look at famine in the Bible, there are three specifics that God said would produce famine in the land of promise. Number one was idolatry. Number two was immorality. And number three was murder. Idolatry, immorality, and murder. Is not the church silent today about the murder of the unborn? I mean, we, we will pick it, but we won't pray. And yet millions of babies are dying every year, and churches are doing nothing about it. I am an adopted child. I found out when I was 39 years old. When I was born, you got back alley abortions somewhere in this world, there was a woman who decided not to abort me, but to give me up. And she gave me up to a Christian family. You see, most of the churches I know really don't care whether I would have been aborted or not. Because if we did, there'd be more Christian-based crisis pregnancy centers in America today. We have four in our part of Georgia. We started in 1992 with one with a $25,000 gift, and now we have four. We have sonograms. When we give a girl a sonogram, there's somebody on the other side of that wall praying for that girl that she will keep that baby. And every year, we're seeing about 1,000 girls, and we're seeing girls saved because there's a famine in the land to tell people that you are loved even if you've messed up your life. We said a little or nothing about human trafficking. I live three hours outside of Atlanta. Atlanta is one of the capitals of the world for sex trafficking and human trafficking. We don't say much about immorality in our church. And so what's the answer? Well, the answer is found in 2 Samuel chapter 21. Let's look at the prayer. 2 Samuel 21, this is a, one of those passages that just jumped up and hit me one day. And uh, I'm not sure I've gotten over it yet. David is praying, which would have been a familiar posture for David. As a man of prayer, a man after God's own heart. 2 Samuel 21 and verse 1, Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. So these were three consecutive years. And David sought the presence of the Lord. And the Lord said, It is for Saul and his bloody house because he put the Gibeonites to death. He sought the Lord. Now, we don't know whether he went to the tabernacle or whether he was just in his private prayer closet. But whatever he did, David said, we're in a problem. We're in a fix. We're in a crisis. And the only answer to this is going to come from God. And so he sought the Lord. And in seeking the Lord, he realized there had to be a root to the problem. There had to be a source of the problem. And so he began to seek the Lord. Something has grieved God. We are in a famine in the land flowing with milk and honey. We are in a famine in the land of promise. Something's wrong and I've got to find out what it is. And so he sought the Lord. Typically, when you see a famine in the Bible, you should always look behind the scenes and see what the source of that famine was. Because there's always something behind the scenes. It, it may look on the surface like a famine problem, but it's something deeper than that. It's something bigger than that. It's the problem behind the problem. And we can miss revival looking at the symptoms that I've just gone over and not go down to the core of the problem and find out what the source of those symptoms are. You see, what looks like the issue may not be the issue. The issue may be the consequence of a sin that you're not aware of yet. And you can't have revival until you seek the Lord. Now, just think about it. Saul sought out Samuel. David sought the Lord. There's a difference in, hey, you know, hey, guys, let's get together. and let, What do you think? You know, what, what do you think? What, what do you think? And we pool our ignorance together 
Because it's easier to just ask, what do you think, than to go alone and seek the Lord. David sought the Lord. You know what Saul sought? Saul sought the Samuel of a lost opportunity. When he could have sought the Lord, he had missed his moment. He had missed the hour. And he sought Samuel, but it was too late. It was too late. And God shows David. He sought the presence of the Lord. You see, we can have a really good church and not seek the presence of the Lord. We can have good worship and not seek the presence of the Lord. We can have good programs and not seek the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord brings revelation. Seeking the presence of God reveals to us things that we will not learn any other way. Seeking the presence of the Lord brings revelation, and it is always a result of us humbling ourselves before God and repenting of not seeking Him earlier. Three years, year after year, in God's presence, and the Lord said, God revealed, it is for Saul and his bloody house. Now, this is important. God says to David, you are reaping from seed sown by Saul. It is not your fault, but you're going to have to deal with it. You didn't cause this problem, but you're going to have to face it. You're going to have to go back before you can move forward. It's not a famine problem. It's a Gibeonite problem. So there's the prayer. Look at the plan. Verse 2. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not the sons of Israel, but the remnant of the Amorites. And the sons of Israel made a covenant with them. But Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the sons of Israel and Judah. Thus David said to the Gibeonites, what should I do for you? And how can I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord. So here's a thought. What was revealed in the presence of God demanded a plan. So God says, it's Saul and his bloody hands because of what he did to the Gibeonites. And so David doesn't say, well, I'm glad to have that answer. I probably ought to call Baptist Press and get them to put an article out on this and say, hey, we all just ought to know that it's because of Saul that we're having this problem. So don't blame me. I need my approval ratings to go back up. And so don't blame me for the problem. It's Saul's problem. He didn't blame. He went to the Gibeonites and he said, how can I make this right with you? You know, that'd bring revival in most churches right there. If just where we're at odds with each other, how can I make this right with you? How can I fix this? What do I need to do? That's the king going to the Gibeonites and humbling himself. (coughs) By the way, same thing happened with Joshua. Remember when they got defeated, little bitty town defeated them, 37 Israelites killed and Joshua's there praying, oh, Lord, you know, we, we, this is the land of promise. I've been, I mean, I've put up with these clowns in the wilderness for 40 years. We finally get over here, <laughs> blow the trumpet, walls come down, and now this little two-bit town on the outside of town, you know, yeah, no, yeah don't worry about it. Just send a little small army over there. And they, we ran back with our tails tucked between our legs. And, and Lord, you know, I just thought this was going to be good. I, thought, I mean, I thought we were going to win. I thought this was land flowing with milk and honey. And God basically said to Joshua in the cat paraphrase, why don't you just shut up? and go deal with the problem. You don't need to be praying about this. You need to be doing something about it. Quit whining and go to work. Deal with the problem in the camp. And so David goes and deals with the consequences of the sin of Saul, and he discovers it's not a famine issue. It's a Gibeonite issue. And always when we get in the presence of God, this is what God will do. That's the problem. Deal with this. Fix that. Confess that. Apologize for this. Humble yourself there. 
Do this, do that. You never get in the presence of God when you're trying to find out why there's a problem going on and God doesn't say, fix it. Do something. Put your faith to work. Now, in, in England, their public schools no longer give an F to students because that, they feel that's demotivating. So they give them a DS, delayed success. <laughs> Listen, folks, if you don't admit failure, you're never going to get out of it. If we're not honest, if we don't admit we failed, we're not going to find a way out. The issue in the church, the issue in our lives, the issue in our nation may not be a famine problem. It may be a Gibeonite problem. You say, well, my problem is money. I just need to make more money. No, maybe the problem is not money. It's how you're spending it and that you've never really turned your stewardship over to the Lord. You know, you got people in in churches that they get, you know, I just, I need the church to help me out. Well, let, let, let us look at your budget, see what you're spending. Oh, I don't want to show you my budget. And then you start digging it. Well, what are you doing? Well, I, you know, I play the lottery. Can the church help me? Well, no. You don't have a money problem. You got an obedience problem. Say, well, you know, my marriage is... No, it may not be your marriage. It may be your attitude about your marriage. That's the problem. Well, my kids, my, the kids may not be the problem. It may be that you need to apologize to your kids for what you've said to them or acted toward them and been one way at church and another way somewhere else. So there's always a problem behind the problem. And, and I don't know if you know this, but what, those of us who are in ministry know this. People, people will say things to us. And you realize about five minutes into it, you're getting about half the story. You know, and, and you never do marriage counseling with one person because the other person is going to say, well, I can tell you stuff. You won't know stuff. I've, I've been keeping a journal. <laughs> See, there's a problem behind the problem. And in God's presence, nothing can be off limits. We cannot say to God, God, don't, don't talk to me about that. Don't do that. Don't, don't, no, leave me alone in that area. When God starts probing in our hearts, he is merciless because he's trying to deal with root issues that are keeping us from living in a land of promise. They're keeping us in a famine condition. The key is if we want to see God to work, we, we got to ask for it even if it hurts. Look at what he did. For three years, year after year, for emphasis, three consecutive years, Saul's pride, his sin, his murdering heart. And so look at the plea in verse 3. What should I do for you? And how can I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? What's it going to take for me to get this right? Uh, and they were quick. Turn over seven descendants of Saul, and we're going to kill them. And David did it without question. Saul sinned. Saul created the problem. His descendants bear the brunt. He turned them over. Now, why? Because he didn't ignore a covenant that he had made. Saul had ignored the covenant that Joshua had made with the Gibeonites in Joshua chapter 9. Although Joshua had been deceived, he still honored the covenant. And he did not break the covenant he had made with Jonathan. And so he spared Jonathan's son. Saul had broken a covenant. David kept a covenant. And he turned them over. Saul had been a bloodbath king. He took blood casually. He wanted to kill David. He had killed the 85 priests. He took blood easily. Now, here's why this is an important lesson for famine. Saul's actions said to the Gibeonites, Your God cannot be trusted to keep his word. We don't trust your God because 
There was a covenant, and Saul broke the covenant. So if Saul is God's king and you're God's people, then your God isn't good to his word. He can't be trusted. And David had to bring it back to seek the Gibeonites' blessings and say to them, our blessings are in your hands. You tell us what we've got to do, we'll do it. We've come before you. We humble ourselves before you. We ask you to forgive us. Now tell us what we need to do. Here's the issue. We have lived in famine so long, we think it's normal. We've lived in famine so long, we think it's normal. Now, I got saved during the days of the Jesus movement. A lot of these guys down here got saved during the days of the Jesus movement. And I remember standing at the front of my home church, and I was crying, and a lady walked up to me, and she said, Don't worry, son, you'll get over it. My first thought, I wasn't full of faith, wisdom, and the Holy Spirit. But my first thought in that moment was, I hope to God I don't become like you. You know, we got way too many people that say they're saved that look like they've been drinking vinegar all their lives. And I think there are people in our church, honestly, on the way to church, they pray, Lord, if you're going to start something today, I pray somehow it'll be stopped. All right, if it's not the bulletin, Lord, you know. You know, if it's not in the bulletin. And we've got things going on in our churches that we need to put on the altar and we need to die to. We need to stop some of the things we're doing because I'm going to tell you, if God has to go out of the church one more time, which he had to do in the Jesus movement, he may bypass us so much that all of us are disqualified. Revival disqualifies a lot of church leaders. It, changes, it, it shuffles the papers. It changes the dynamics. And I don't want to be so accustomed to famine that I'm content and satisfied and settled when people are not saved and when lives are not changed and when seats are not filled. I don't want to look and say, well, that's just the way things are. Why are they that way? Why is there a famine? Why are we in this mess? Why are we dealing with all this? You see, there's going to be no great move of God until we deal with the issues that are revealed in the presence of God. First sign of the famine, I would say we should run to Jesus. I hope, I hope I'm not stealing anything from Tom, but Tom and I have talked about this a lot about why People don't give invitations anymore. Because when you give an invitation, this is Tom, this is not me. <laughs> when you give an invitation, you have to die to yourself. Because you're not asking people to respond to you. You're asking people to respond to Jesus. And let me tell you something, folks. We've had a lot of Sundays at Sherwood when they've been backed up all the way across the front, down the aisles as far as they could go got as close as they could get. But we've had some Sundays when I thought this is the kind of service where there ought to be 200 people down here at the altar and there'd be three. And the same three that have been there every week <laughs> for years. And I have people criticize them. And I say, well, at least they come. And you got to die. And I want to tell you, my flesh doesn't want to die that all the time. I, sometimes I want to help people get down there. And if the Holy Spirit can't convict them, I'll, I'll tongue slap them into getting down there. <laughs> but just think of all the things we've given up, and you'll know why we're having a famine. We've given up the prayer meeting. We've given up nights of prayer. We've basically given up on evangelism. We've given up on revival meetings. You know, you used to have two-week meetings, and then it wasn't convenient, so we went to one-week meetings and went to Sunday through Sunday, then that wasn't convenient, then we went to Sunday to Wednesday, and now we're down to one-day harvest crusades, which really is one service because we can't get people to come back on Sunday night. And we keep backing up, and the enemy keeps taking the ground, and nobody's ever asking, God, how did we get in this shape? Because I'm going to tell you, there are places in the world they'll walk for days 
to go see a work of God. Two days ago in South Africa, you may not agree with them theologically. I don't know what all happened, but I know this. 1.7 million people walked, drove themselves to one place in South Africa to pray for a day. We get 17 people in a prayer meeting. Most of our churches, we think we're having revival. <laughs> National Day of Prayer, if anybody even remembers it in our church, we're thinking, oh, wow, you know, we had two people remember it's National Day of Prayer. We must, boy, God's really moving. We're in a famine. When we have been in a famine so long that we think where we are right now is normal, we're in a serious famine. And we're malnourished. We cannot continue. David put himself at the mercy of whatever the Gibeonites decided. And he dealt with the consequences. 1 Samuel 2.30 says, Them that honor me, I will honor. Let me tell you what happens at an altar. At an altar, we balance the books. At an altar, we break the bondage. Because it's a humbling of ourselves. It's a surrendering of ourselves. At an altar, we find that there's living water and bread of life to feed the famine. At an altar, restoration is made. At an altar, forgiveness is offered. At an altar, we seek the presence of God. We've done now about 34 refresh conferences, and uh, Tom's done most of those. Bill's done a lot. Bob's done some of them. And, and uh, there have been some moments... Honest to goodness, there have been some moments when I just stood back. I said, God, I can't believe what you're doing. I've watched young couples go to the nursery and get their babies out of the nursery and come to the altar and lay their baby on an altar and give their babies to Jesus. Amen. Only God can do that. There's not a sermon good enough to get anybody to do that. I've watched people walk across a room to ask for forgiveness of things that have gone on for years. I came off the platform two Sundays ago, and a guy was waiting for me down there. I mean, he's a big guy. He could have taken me out in a New York second. And he was shaking. And my security guard said, I always worry about a six foot five guy that's shaking. I had not seen the guy in 20 years. He said, I got mad at you 20 years ago, and I left. He said, I got mad at you about something that you said in a sermon. He said, and I realized that you didn't say it. God said it because it's in his word. And I've come today to ask you to forgive me. 20 years. 20 years. You see, when you finally are tired of famine, you'll do anything to get bread and water. You'll go anywhere. You'll climb any mountain. You'll cross any river. You'll go anywhere to get bread and water when you're tired of a famine. I pastored in Oklahoma for three years before I went to Sherwood. I've been at Sherwood 28 years this year. And God has done some Remarkable things that I just stand back and I'm, I'm amazed at them. And it's all because in 1991, Don Miller helped us start our intercessory prayer ministry. And everything that Sherwood is today, uh, people like to talk to us about our movies and about what we do and everything else. And those are great. And we've had a great time doing them, but can I tell you something? We've never made one decision without it being bathed in prayer. We didn't start the movie ministry until we prayed. We never cast a movie until we had prayed. We never edited a movie until we had prayed. We never put a final edit out until we had prayed. And all that that did now in 140 countries with those movies, 100 million people have seen Flywheel, which we made for $20,000. 100 million Spanish-speaking people have seen Flywheel. We know of 10,000 people saved with fireproof, countless marriages that were saved. But none of that would have happened 
in a prayerless church. I could have cast the biggest vision in the world. I told you, we're in the fourth poorest city in America. We just finished a $26 million project in the fourth poorest city in America. I mean, we got people that on welfare, we've got homeless people. I'm, I'm just telling you, only God can do. Three years ago, we were $26 million in debt. Today, we're $11 million in debt in the fourth poorest city in America. It's not because I'm a good fundraiser. It's because God's good at getting people's attention. But I want to tell you where it started with me. And I'm going to bring you up to speed real quick. It started sitting under the preaching of Vance Havner. Right after I saved in Jesus movement, I met Vance Havner. He poured into my life. The, the, the year that Vance Havner died, God sent Ron Dunn to pour into my life. Two years before Ron died, I began a relationship with Warren Wiersbe. And then God brought Tom and other people. And every person he's brought into my life has told me, be desperate for God. You're not that good. Your personality's not strong enough. Your gifts are your hindrance. You be desperate for God. So after 15 years of being a youth minister, I went to pastor. For three years, I pastored the First Baptist Church of Trivial Pursuit. <laughs> we had 78 deacons. We were a deacon-possessed church. <laughs> Just to show you God never gets through, that church just had a move of God and they had 118 people saved and 90 of them baptized in two weeks. In two weeks. <clears throat> but while I was pastoring that church, I mean, we were in a battle. Every day was a battle. Every deacon's meeting was a battle. I mean, I put on all the armor in Ephesians 6 and a few, you know, automatic weapons. I mean, I... <laughs> I got everything I could just to survive. And a friend of mine, David Walker, who's a pastor in San Antonio, came to do a wild game dinner for me and we were sitting in the driveway at the office and I noticed that David got real quiet and I hadn't said anything to him, hadn't said a word to him. And Sammy will tell you, David's got a lot of spiritual sensitivity. And David said, you having trouble? I said, man, you can't believe how much trouble I'm having. So he spoke. We went to my house. He spent the night in my house that night. So I started talking to him after the event was over. And David got up and said, Michael, we got to get up. We got to go to the church right now. Now, I don't know what this does to your theology, <clears throat> but I'm just telling you, I was there, and I can testify to it. He said, you've got a demon that's taking up residence in the top of your church, and if you don't deal with him, it's going to destroy you. Now, let me back up. Three weeks before, I was preaching, and I noticed a guy. This was before everybody wore black. <clears throat> and I noticed a guy sitting over here. He's dressed in a black suit and a black shirt. He's got a white beard and white hair, and he's sitting over there, and he wasn't there when the service started, and he wasn't there when I started preaching, and it was the kind of building where you could see anybody walk in at any time. I mean, nobody could walk in and out of that building without you knowing they had walked in. And I look over, and he's all of a sudden there, and he's staring me down. Now, our staff is sitting where they can see all around the building. And so I start preaching, and just he gets up. And he starts walking out. He starts walking off this wall. And so I'm just, you know, I'm going to follow him. So I'm just walking and I'm following him. I'm just preaching. And I'm following him. He looks at me and he gets right to the doors at the back. And he pulls a red bandana out of his pocket. And he ties it around his neck and he hangs it up like a noose. And then he disappears. He comes back in the church. I look over there and he's not there. <clears throat> I don't know what this does to your theology. They didn't teach me this in a Baptist school, I can tell you that. 
and I don't see a demon under every rock, but if you don't think they're out there, you're, you're going to be in a famine. And so I said to the staff, I said, who was that guy? What guy? The guy in the black that got up and walked around. The minister of music sitting on the platform. That's when we used to sit on the platform. And the minister of music sitting on the platform said, I didn't see anybody move. I asked the youth guy. He was sitting right to the side. He said, I didn't see that. So I'm telling David that story. He said, I'm telling you, you got demons taking up residence in your church. So we sat out in the car and he said, Michael, you confess every sin you've ever thought about committing before we go in this church. And we sat in the car for an hour, hour and a half. <laughs> I wore Miss Bertha's sin list out, man. I mean, I just, you know, we sat in the car. I confessed. Her. He confessed. We went in the church. He said, tell me where he's sitting. So we walk in. The lights are dark. This, this building had no outside lights. And it's dark in the room, and he goes over there, and, and I mean, David starts pleading the blood of Jesus and quoting scripture. And I mean, he goes, and all of a sudden, he just kind of reaches down and he goes like this, and he starts carrying somebody out. And he kicks the door open, and he kicks the outside door open. And he says, In the name of Jesus, get out of this building. I didn't learn that in seminary. So he comes back in and says, Michael, here's what we're going to do. He says, I want you to show me where all the people that cause you trouble sit in this church. And so I realized something. For the first time, the area under our balcony was dark. It was not lit well. And it was almost like sitting in a theater. And everybody that caused me problems was sitting in the darkness. And he started praying. And he walked us up to the front. He said, now, Michael, here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to lay down on your face behind this pulpit. And I want you to confess the sins of the pulpit against the pew. Every sin that you can think of that you've committed against these people by not being a good shepherd, every sin you've committed by preaching in your flesh or ministering in your flesh, I want you to lay down and confess it and then listen to God. He's going to tell you things that you need to confess for people who were here before you. He said, when you get through, I'm going to confess the sins of the pew. And I'm going to ask God to show me. And I want to tell you something. I laid there. I soaked that carpet. My nose running. My eyes crying. And I prayed about things I didn't even know had happened. I mean, God would just show me this happened and this happened. This happened and this happened. And God would just show me. These were things that had happened where the man of God stood behind the pulpit and either didn't preach the word of God without apology or abuse the word of God or didn't exegete correctly the word of God or didn't teach the people right or did all his work in his flesh. And that was about an hour. And then David started praying. Things that I had not mentioned to him. He started praying. And then while I laid there on my face on that floor, he started walking around the room. Well, the church pianist was giving me fits. He just walked. I didn't say a word. He walks over to the piano. He said, Father, the people, the, the, whoever's hands are on these keys are full of the devil. And then he went in the choir president of the choir hated my guts. And he stopped. I could tell where he was. He stopped right at the seat that she sat in and started praying. This person has a resistant spirit to the work of God in this church. And we left about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. I had to take David to the airport in Oklahoma City, so we got up about 5.30 the next morning. And man, I'm telling you, you know, I mean, I'm walking in glory and in victory. I mean, I'm, I'm feeling great. And, and I dropped David off at the airport, and I'm somewhere south of Moore, Oklahoma. And I mean, this cold air comes into my car that shouldn't have been in there. And the fear of the enemy swarmed my car, and I thought I was going to go off the road. And I realized what was happening. God had put seed on the soil. And the devil was trying to steal it. And I rolled the windows down and I claimed every scripture I could claim. I rebuked the devil, everything I knew to rebuke. 
I prayed loud. I was shouting. I know people are driving down the interstate thinking, this guy is out of his mind. And we had, <clears throat> that was in the days where we had the mounted phones with the cords. And so I called the church and I said, I'll be back at the church in 35 minutes. Meet me in the auditorium. I need to talk. So I called the staff. And I started having a good time with the Lord. In fact, I had such a good time with the Lord. I went almost all the way to Falls Creek. I went, I went 45 minutes past my exit. Had to turn around and come back. They're still sitting in the church waiting for me. I told them what happened. I said, guys, we're going to seal what God did last night. So we prayed over the room. The next Sunday morning, the power went off the minute I stood up to preach. No lights. That day, 13 adults were saved. And for the next six or eight weeks, every week, we had people saved. All because this preacher had to get to the source of the famine. I was trying to fight the deacons with a title and with my personality. And 78 against one is not good odds. But when I got there and I humbled myself before God, God did what I couldn't do. And so I want to invite you in these moments. If you're a pastor, I want to ask you in the name of Jesus to just go before God and just say, God, I want to confess before you the sins of the pulpit. Things I've done, things people have done. It may be an all something somebody did before you. It's not your fault, but you've got to deal with it because it's affected the pew. And if you're a church member, you're a member of some church, then I'm going to ask you to confess the sins of the pew. You don't have to know all of them. God will show you what you need to confess. So if you want to use this as an altar, if you want to use your seat as an altar, if you physically can't kneel, if you just want to bow your head before the Lord, I just want us to take some moments here and just get before God and say, God, these are the sins that are keeping us in a famine. And we must get through this to get to you. They're hindering us, so you pray. Call out to God. Don't live in a famine any longer. Let's clear it out tonight in these moments.
revival in here. Relational revival in here. We'll never have it in our churches. Lord, there's so many of us that are so tired of living in a land of famine when your promises have not changed. Your power is no less than it was in the Acts 2 church. Lord, a lot of us are tired of hearing about what you're doing around the world and just desperate for you to do something here. We rejoice in what you're doing around the world, but God, we need it in our churches. We need it in our homes. Or we need the remnant to be aflame with a passion for revival. Forgive us, Father, of our prayerlessness. Forgive us of doing worship service where Prayer is nothing more than a bridge between songs and, and to take up an offering, but we never stop just to acknowledge who you are. Forgive us, Father, when we're more worried about the clock than we are about the Christ who sits and intercedes for us. Forgive us, Lord, when we sleep with constitutions and bylaws and committee meetings, notes on top of our Bibles, as if that's what the church is all about. Forgive us, Father, when we think the temperature's got to be right, the seat's got to be comfortable, the music's got to be at the right decibel. We have to have the bulletin and we have to get our announcements made. Forgive us when we just don't show up. Saying, Lord, if you don't show up, we're sunk. Lord, I don't know what's ahead for the American church. But I know you don't owe us a thing. We have squandered our inheritance in the pig pen of consumerism and self-centered Christianity. We have watered down the word to get a crowd, but not a congregation. And if persecution does come, we have a lot less Christians than we say we have right now. God, would you one more time before you come back? Would you please... the heavens and come down that the mountains might shake in your presence Lord I give credit to my friend Alvin Reed most of us are too old to start a revival but we're not too old to kill one and God forgive us that we're like the church in the 60s and 70s that looked at young people with long hair and drugged out backgrounds and sleeping on the streets and said, if you'll clean up, you can come. Lord, you said, whosoever will can come. And forgive us if the church is not ready for your next move. not a denominational office that can figure this out. All the organization in the world can't make this happen. It's going to take a move of heaven and the breath of the Spirit. Lord, the wind blows where it wills. And Lord, would you please start a breeze somewhere with somebody and spread the fires of revival across our land just one more time before it's too late. If it's to prepare us for judgment, then so be it. 
But God, don't let us face what's ahead without seeking you. I want to ask you, if you would, just to stand. Mark's going to lead us in a song. And as we sing, would we, could we sing this as a song of prayer to the Lord? Lord, I run to you. No one else will do. Lord, in troubled times, I will run straight to you. Though my heart and flesh may fail, you're my ever-present help, my tower of strength, my portion to be of good cheer, be of good cheer, for you have overcome, overcome the world. I lift my eyes to things I love that God's doing at Sherwood is our folks that do worship understand revival. They've lived with it. They've talked it. They've seen what God has done. But here's what I want to ask you to do for just a moment. I want you to break up in groups of two or three or four, four at the most. And I'll ask you to pray this. I want to ask two of you in that group to pray about specific things you know that are sins of the pulpit in America today. And then two of you to pray specifically for sins in the pew today. Everybody do that? Can everybody do that? Can you think of a few? So just two of you, sins of the pulpit, two of you, sins of the pew. And if you'll pray, and then we're going to sing this song again in just a moment. 